Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Helen Kane and I am the founder and managing director of Pivot MSL, which is a specialist consultancy with a core focus on driving excellence for the role of the MSL, the Medical Science Liaison, and the wider medical affairs function. This morning, I'm going to give you a perspective, and that's really all it can be in a brief 15 minutes, on the evolving medical affairs function. So before I begin, I'd like to thank Peter Llewellyn for the opportunity to present this morning at this MedCom's networking event. Before I begin, a little bit about us, what is our story? So my background is um, largely based in the pharmaceutical industry. In fact, more than 25 years spent working within medical affairs. And Pivot is a specialist consultancy which was actually born out of a passion for the role of the MSL and the wider medical affairs function. And we have grown now to be a globally recognised consultancy which works across the global biopharmaceutical industry. So let's just set the scene before we go any further. The Industry these days is referred to as biopharmaceutical. The, the term pharma seems to be disappearing from our vocabulary. But what is the purpose? What is the purpose of this industry? And I would suggest that any company website that we go to will make clear reference to the patient. And the, fo the focus of this industry is very much around bringing life-saving and life-enhancing medicines to patients. And for the vast majority of organisations, the way in which this is achieved is through the four phases that we see on this slide. The birth of the drug, as it's often referred to, is the discovery phase. And from there, molecules move through to the phase that we call development or the clinical research phase. The next step in a best case scenario is that the molecule then moves forward to go through approval, through the regulatory approval phase and finally to the phase known as commercialisation. And broadly speaking, these four phases are referred to as the drug life cycle. There are often many negative comments made about the pharmaceutical industry, but I for one am hugely proud of all that we have achieved. And the evidence is clear all around us in that patients throughout the world are living longer, healthier and more productive lives thanks to the medicines that are being developed throughout this industry. And the process that we referred to earlier, the process called drug development, is captured on what we can see here as perhaps quite a busy slide, but I think that there are a number of key messages that we might take away from it. The first is that in fact drug development is an incredibly lengthy process. So you can see here duration being predicted at anything between 10 and 15 years. And beneath that, you will see anticipated cost for bringing a new molecule to the market can be anything in the region of $2.5 billion. So we have a very lengthy and expensive process. And as we move through this process from discovery to commercialization, we can see that there are a huge number of stakeholders, both within an organisation and externally, who might be involved or who will be involved in bringing a drug to the market. 
And what that then leads us to see is that we have got externally multiple stakeholders that an internal organisation might be wishing to engage with. And the old world of pharma is that the regulators and government bodies and the like insisted that there needed to be clear separation between the development process and the commercialization, the promotional world as it were. And this space was occupied by a function or today is very much occupied by the function that we term medical affairs. And really, in the simplest of terms, we can imagine that medical affairs sits as a bridge between the development side of the industry, between R&D and the commercial side of the industry. So we understand that within the development side of the industry, the stakeholders that the organisation might be engaging with will largely have a focus on the conduct of the clinical trials. And yet when we look at the commercialisation side of the organisation, the external stakeholders are likely to be different. These are the individuals who are more likely to be the prescribers. But ultimately, what we see at the top is that the patient is at the centre of everything that we do. So pharma is an ultimate support of the patient. Now, as you will recall, I'm here to talk about the evolving medical affairs function. And certainly when I joined the industry as a pharmacist, um, medical affairs was very much seen as a support function. So key stakeholders for medical affairs historically have been the commercial teams, the sales and the marketing teams. But that was the old world and today we live in a space where the evolution is very fast because of the huge demands that are happening externally. And what you see on this slide are just simply some of the external factors that are impacting on the way in which the pharma organisation model operates. And not least, we can see here that we have the patient voice. The voice of the patient is very important within our industry now. Technology is placing huge demands on the industry. So we have science that is more complex than ever before. And we have physicians and we have healthcare providers who are under significant pressures within their own environments to do the right thing by the patient. So what we see here are a huge number of factors which are impacting the way in which pharma works. And as a result, what we see today is that medical affairs is evolving from being historically something of a supportive function to being recognised as much more as a critical business partner. People talk about having a seat at the table. And there is a body of evidence out there to support this. If you were to Google the evolving medical affairs function today, there are a wealth of publications in support of this. So what does this mean in reality? This means in reality that for the medical affairs function, their stakeholders are changing. Their stakeholders internally are different, but actually the stakeholders with which they are engaging with externally have grown exponentially. One thing that remains constant though, is that the focus of medical affairs is to ensure that patients can have access to the drugs that add such a huge difference to their lives. In an ideal world, we would aspire within medical affairs to be seen externally as a peer. That is our ultimate aspiration. We talk about being trusted scientific partners. 
Much is written about this within the body of the literature I alluded to earlier. But in fact, trust needs to be earned. Trust needs to be won. And when we ask the external stakeholder or the physicians what they believe to be the relationship that they have with the pharma company or the biopharma company, unfortunately, what they will often say is this. You can see on the screen, I meet four or five people from the organisation and it seems as if they don't talk to one another. I have information overload. There is just so much data out there. I am overwhelmed and I am time poor. Sometimes it seems it takes ages to get an answer to my question. And by the time I've had the answer, I've moved on to another problem. So our view, our belief in pharma is that we have the ability to be a trusted scientific partner. And yet it would appear that when we stand in the shoes of our stakeholders, that there is a mismatch between what, what we believe we can offer and in fact what we are providing. So when we look at medical affairs in action, what is it that we do? What is it that this function is able to provide in terms of engaging with the physician or external stakeholder? And there are a huge number of activities, but being a very simple creature, I like to break it down into these categories. So effectively, we within medical affairs, we are able to engage. We engage externally and we engage internally. We build relationships. We embark upon scientific exchange. We might have um, a dialogue or, or an exchange of views. We are able to educate with respect to subjects that are of interest to both the physician and the patient. Medical affairs is involved in the generation of data. These might be real world evidence data um, or post marketing data. And last but by no means least, patient safety is paramount for medical affairs. And this is a critical function. So what does that then mean if those are the activities that we just talk about? What does that then mean for the individuals who are involved in conducting those activities? So as in, 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 in through engagement, we become a connector. Through exchange, we might be a facilitator. Through medical education, we then assume the role of educator. In terms of data generation, our role might be that of a collaborator. And finally, with respect to patient safety issues, we have a clear role there about being a communicator. So what we can see here is that individuals within medical affairs might have to flex between throughout these activities and in doing so, they take on a number of roles. So what does this mean? for anyone who is working within medical affairs today. Certainly at the time that I joined the industry, it was acceptable that you might be a pharmacist or a medic and you may not have worked in the industry. The attraction was that you had this broad scientific expertise. But in terms of this evolving function, we have very different expectations and needs with respect to the core competencies for medical affairs. And this is a very high level slide, but what we can see here is that absolutely the scientific knowledge, the depth of knowledge with respect to the therapy area, with respect to the way we apply the science, our understanding of research, the healthcare systems, our ability to be critical, our understanding of trials, that is absolutely core, but it is by no means enough. In addition, in order for medical affairs to continue having the seat at the table, business acumen is a critical competency.
What is the purpose of pharma? How does pharma operate? How do we ensure that our activities are aligned to organisational goals? What are the governance frameworks that we need to be operating within to minimise risk to the organisation? How do we manage multiple projects? And last, but by no means least, we have the interpersonal skills. Fundamentally, what we are doing is we're having human to human relationships, whether that is internally or externally. So there are expectations that individuals working within medical affairs will have excellent verbal and written skills. They will be great collaborators. They will be able to work effectively within a matrix organisation. They have the ability to deliver with excellence in terms of presentation skills. Their networking skills are strong. Their relationship management skills are strong. And of course, that they apply an element of emotional intelligence in all that they do. This is a tall order. This is a tall order for medical affairs in the current climate. So in summary, medical affairs is undergoing a period of rapid evolution and there are many phases to medical affairs. It is, however, uniquely placed as a strategic partner to the internal organisation and as a trusted partner to the physician in ultimate support of the patient. But trust has to be earned. Trust has to be earned through the science, through our ability to be objective and through our understanding of what is happening for the external stakeholder. The competency set for medical affairs has expanded hugely. But the final point that I really wish to make is that in order for organisations to really drive excellence within their medical affairs functions, they need to support and develop their teams so that they're able to deliver appropriately. Thank you.